Hello, and welcome to the Mechanochemistry Discussions, hosted by the NSF Center for Mechanical Control of Chemistry, or the CMCC. The goal of this seminar series is to bring the community together through seminars streamed live on the third Thursday of every month at 10 a.m. Central. The seminars are also posted on YouTube so that you can watch them for the first time or over and over again at your convenience. We have an outstanding slate of speakers for the mechanochemistry discussions in 2021. Some of those in the past, present, and future are shown here. Note that the seminar is being recorded. If you're watching live, you can send your questions to cmccdiscussions at gmail.com and we will migrate them to the speaker. If you have an account, you can post your questions live on YouTube but please note that we do reserve the right to remove any comments from the YouTube channel if they do not adhere to our values of inclusion and respect. Before we get started, a great big thank you to Dr. James Batiste, the director of the CMCC, Noah Sheehan, a student at Texas A&M helping us with the logistics of the seminar, and Jennifer Belsick, the CMCC administrative coordinator. Thank you so much for joining us here. Please do subscribe on YouTube and follow us on Twitter. Without further ado, let me introduce today's speaker, Dr. Stephen Craig. Dr. Craig received his undergraduate degrees um, from Duke in 1991. After a year at Cambridge, he began doctoral work at Stanford, where he received his PhD in 1997. Following his PhD, Dr. Craig took a position as a research chemist in DuPont Central Research until early 1999, when he moved to a postdoctoral position at the Scripps Research Institute. In 2000, he joined the Department of Chemistry at Duke, where he is now the William T. Professor of Chemistry, again, at Duke. Really excited to have Dr. Stephen Craig. Thank you, and we look Great, thanks, uh, thanks very much. Um, so it's uh, wonderful to join you all this, uh, this morning. Uh, the, Subject of my talk is going to be a flavor of mechanochemistry that's a little bit different than what's uh, emphasized in the, the center here, and it involves coupling mechanical forces and polymers to covalent chemical reactions. Uh, before I get started talking about the chemistry in particular, I want to be sure to give credit to those who are really responsible uh, for it. And, and so the first story that I'll uh, share today um, is the result of the thesis work of Yudi Zhang, who graduated just last, uh, just last spring. And then I'll uh, transition to a, a second story that involves contributions uh, led by Xu Wang and uh, Zi Wang, uh, who are part of another Center for Chemical Innovation uh, that I direct known as uh, Monet. And this, uh, this story also involves important collabor uh, collaborative contributions from Julia Callow, uh, Jeremiah Johnson and Brad Olson and uh, Michael Rubenstein. I'll tell you more about those as, as we get there. Uh, I do wanna say that if uh, particularly for those of you who are part of the general non-scientific audience for this talk. If you want to engage further with some of the material I'll talk about uh, today, a really fun way of doing this is, um, is through a publicly accessible uh, concert that, that our center produced, known as Art of Polymers. You can go to this, uh, this website or, or Google it up. And, uh, and it involves a, a mix of original compositions inspired by our, by our center's work, trying to convey science through music, involves musical robots, instruments made from research materials out of our center, interspersed with scientific uh, talks, and it's, it's really a hoot. So if, uh, if you have a chance and you're interested, I encourage you to, to uh, check it out and, uh, and let us know what you think. All right, so the big picture for, uh, for the talk today, um, I'll, I'll motivate with, uh, with this figure of a tire graveyard, and I'll come back to this a little later in the, in the talk, but the, this is, um, sort of emblematic of the, the fact that mechanical processes and in particular mechanical damage, right? The, in this case, the wearing way of, uh, of the tread of a tire is all around us in our in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, and even to the scope that if I just look at this one physical phenomenon of, of tire wear, it results in about a quarter of a billion of tires a year, just domestically in the United States. Um, needing disposal. And so, so one of the motivating questions for the ways 
that uh, that my group thinks about uh, about chemistry in this this context is is what can we do as chemists to have an impact on that mechanical process uh, or potentially to to exploit it and at its core one of the one of the concepts that I want to drive home today is that that this problem and problems like it really are fundamentally organic chemistry uh, problems. Because if you zero in on what's happening in that mechanical wearing down of a tire tread, it involves little bits of the rubber in the tire breaking off, right? So there's this crack that's propagating through that, that polymeric material that makes, makes the tire. And that process of crack propagation involves polymer chains that are initially um, kind of relaxed and randomly coiled, being stretched out, extended until you start to deform bonds and bond angles, and ultimately culminating with a chemical reaction, uh, most typically the homolytic scission of a carbon-carbon bond. Okay. But um, if you think about this process, which historically is largely the same for almost any kind of rubbery synthetic uh, polymer, it's really sort of an amazing process, at least to, to me and to my group when we think about it. Because at the end of that process is the covalent scission or the scission of a covalent bond uh, as a result of the, this mechanical force. And, and that's, that's really a difficult reaction to do under normal circumstances, right? Activation energy is 85 kcals per mole. It's sort of a lifetime of the universe proposition. Um, but here it is. That's the rate determining chemical step that ultimately sort of limits the, you know, say the lifetime of, of a tire or other polymer uh, materials. Okay? And so can we, can we use the mechanical forces that are intrinsic to materials under load to drive new types of chemistry? Um, or can we embed even say known chemistry that we now couple through these mechanical forces and use them to drive new types of material responses? And what I'd like to do is tell two short stories today, one um, off of uh, uh, related to each of those, uh, those kinds of opportunities as, as we see them. And all of this, the idea is to think about polymer strands within uh, mechanically stressed or strained environments as being reaction vessels that are now coupled to mechanical energy as, uh, as an input. And I, you know, I won't go through sort of the history of the, the field here, but just to, to say that over the you know, past decade or, or so, there's been a lot of, um, uh, I think really encouraging work in this area involving taking mechanical forces that normally are destructive, using them to trigger uh, uh, stress strengthening reactions like cross-linking in materials, trapping transition states under, under tension or driving uh, molecules down reaction pathways that are normally forbidden to them. Uh, have stress sensing through turning on color change, activating catalysts uh, and, and the like. Uh, in addition, you can take chemically triggered reactions here with uh, shown with color change and use them to bring chemical responses into soft devices that are already functional on their own. So we can now add chemical functionality, um, for example, to soft robots here in the bottom left, electroactive, soft electroactive displays in the top, top right. And we've done other work with stretchable antennas, electronic skin, and the like all realized by coupling macroscopic stresses and strains to molecular chemical responses in a very specific and molecularly engineered way. Okay, so, so with that kind of big picture, let me tell you a, a couple fairly focused uh, stories. And the first involves um, understanding and ultimately exploiting a very simple conformational effect to, to enhance mechanical response. Uh, and this story begins with a serendipitous sabbatical. And unfortunately, not, not mine, but, um, but the sabbatical uh, was taken by Tuan Bing Tang, who's a professor at the University of South Carolina. And he came to Duke uh, a few years ago. Tuan Bing does this really beautiful polymer chemistry work 
and he puts metallocenes into, into poly polymers, most notably cobalt cenium, but he's very broadly interested in these classes of, of polymers. And he had been interested for some time in asking the question about you know, whether it's possible to mechanically activate metallocenes like ferrocene as, as shown here. And so uh, Tuan Bing worked, uh, and a, a student in his group worked with Yudi um, in, in mine to show that uh, ferrocene, despite being incredibly stable, is sort of a prototypical, you know, structural inorganic organometallic uh, complex, uh, is actually remarkably labile mechanically. So that despite its uh, relative uh, inactivity, uh, to, to uh, or lack of reactivity in general, um, it could be mechanically activated fairly easily in what we determined was a heterolytic process. So you could just pull one of the CP ligands off of ferrocene. You could release iron two uh, into solution where you could trap it uh, with, a, with a ligand. Around the same time, Katerina Fromm and Chris Dater at the University of Freiburg had uh, uh, discovered and, and reported the same thing. Um, but this, you know, really was uh, uh, was a pretty remarkable um, observation for for us, and in in particular, because of that kind of thermal force free stability that is inherent to ferrocene, right? Its general lack of of uh, reactivity, uh, but its ability to be uh, activated mechanically fairly fairly easily, and so we wanted to understand that mechanism a little bit more and what the, you know, what goes into it and how might we be able to even alter it to give even greater combinations of stability and increased uh, in the absence of force and activity in the presence of force. And so in order to, to probe that, uh, Yudi um, came up with the idea to, um, to move from incorporating multiple ferrocenes along a, polymer, a single polymer, right, where the traditional ferrocene, the idea was you activate it by pulling one of those CP ligands off, but that necessarily involves the breaking of the polymer chain. And so you're limited to a single activation of you know, just one ferrocene per chain breaking event. Um, to using these ferrocene affanes along the back. Uh, along the polymer backbone. So the idea now is that we're going to take those two CP ligands and tie them together um, so that when you pop open the ferrocene, you might still release the, the iron, but the chain would remain intact so that you could then transfer tension to another ferrocene affane and so on and so forth, and we could get multiple activations. And this allowed us, um, among other things that I'll, I'll get to in a little bit, uh, to do some really quantitative studies of the mechanical activation through single molecule force spectroscopy. So over the years, uh, in my lab have worked out methodology for probing mechanical reactions in single molecules using an atomic micro force microscope as shown in the cartoon here. And so the, the idea is that we can trap with you know, reasonable success rates, individual polymer chains between the tip of an AFM and an opposing surface. And we can pull those polymers. Initially, you pull them, they stretch, you start deforming bond lengths, bond angles. But as the force continues to go up, as you continue to pull, eventually the force gets large enough to tr trigger covalent reactions along the backbone. Um, and if that chemical reaction does what we were hoping that we would see in the ferrocene veins, which is to open up that mechanically functional group or mechanophore, then you could see that through a release of stored length that allows the polymer to grow longer. And because we have many copies, not just one as shown in the cartoon at the top of the slide here, but many copies of these mechanophores along the backbone, that results in a plateau in the force extension curve, shown in red on the bottom of this slide, where you were actually watching the polymer grow longer through these mechanical reactions. Because we're observing this in real time, we can figure out how many reactions are occurring as a function of time for a given force. And so we can extract effective rate constants as a function of force for these reactions. 
And I won't talk too much about the second point here, but I do want to, to mention that this has actually turned out to be a, a pretty uh, empowering strategy for us because it has allowed us to, when we know enough about the general shapes of the potential energy surfaces, to actually measure how much longer the transition state of a reaction is than the, the ground state of the, the reactant itself and provides a really nice mechanistic probe that we've used, for example, to look at you know, trends in transition state geometry as a function of substituent and the, and the like. More generally, it's allowed us to probe reaction mechanisms. And uh, in particular, this, this latter point uh, um, I'd like to illustrate uh, today. So I won't go into the uh, specifics of all of the synthetic chemistry in, involved here. You can maybe get an idea from, um, uh, from this slide of the, the way we go about making these, these polymers. But at the end of the day, what we end up with are these ferrocenophanes, abbreviated FCP in the, in the scheme at the top that are embedded uh, with multiple copies of the same uh, ferrocenophane mechanophore along a given polymer chain. We copolymerize with this epoxidized monomer uh, because these epoxides provide a handle to get very strong attachments to the tip of the AFM that allows us to, to pull through the chemistry uh, that we're interested in. Um, and you know, my vision going into this was this was an interesting experiment because um, the only purpose of that tether, but the only purpose of that tether was essentially to keep the strand, the polymer from breaking when we break the ferrocene, um, but that everything that we measured would probably be more or less indicative of the mechanical strength of ferrocene itself. Um, UD was, uh, uh, I think anticipated much better than I did what rich territory this might be. And, and so ultimately she ended up making these three different ferrocenophanes that differ either in the number of uh, the length, number of carbons in the tether between the two uh, cyclopentadienyl substituents or in the stereochemistry of the, uh, of the attachment uh, points um, in the case of the three carbon bridge. So those two attachment points are either what we refer to as in cis positions or trans kind of relative to the way the tether at the far side of the, uh, of the ferrocenophane is, is positioned. And so she made you know, uh, different polymers with each of these uh, different, uh, different mechanophores goes and does the single molecule force spectroscopy on them. Um, and what we see qualitatively is very much what we expected, that you pull, as you get to a high enough force, you start driving the ring opening of these ferrocenophanes. And we see that through the, uh, the plateau in these force extension curves. Um, but what jumped, oh, and, and I should say that, again, from these curves, we can actually extract reaction rates for that ring opening as a function of the force that's, that's applied there. Um, what really jumped out to us uh, from these experiments um, were two things. The, the, the first is, and you know, I won't kind of set the full uh, context of, for this, but what I will say is that relative to other mechanophores that we had looked at, and even given that we expect that we knew that ferrocene was more mechanically active than we thought, these ferrocenes were way more mechanically reactive than expected. In other words, the force required to drive these transitions on the, you know, under the conditions of these experiments. Right? And so you can look and see on the right that we're looking at rates on the order of 10 to 100 per second here, rate constants on the order of 10 to 100 per second at these forces that the forces required to get those reaction rate constants were much less than we, we expected. So, so that's one, that these are very mechanochemically uh, active. And the, the second point was that they aren't all the same, despite you know, what I confessed was my anticipation going in, that really the, the nature of those attachments, whether they were three carbons or five carbons or cis or trans, uh, has a big difference. Okay, or it has a big effect. And, and so, um, so both based on those observations and then some others that we did to kind of 
tie things back to the original Phariseen, and I won't go through the details today, we could set up this relative scale of mechanochemical uh, activity here. Um, and uh, where, where the Phariseen that we were motivated um, by its reactivity initially here, right, is actually the least mechanochemically active of the, of the lot. Um, and so it begs the question, you know, so what, what is it that actually determines that relative reactivity? And of course, the, as you might imagine, our gut level response was, well, it's, it's ring strain, right? And just we're kind of building these, uh, uh, these strained rings into the ferrocenophanes. But, but th that turns out not to explain, uh, explain what's going on. Um, and you can appreciate that uh, a number of ways. The first is that the five carbon bridged chain shown uh, second from the, the left here has maybe a kcal per mole of ring strain. So very, very negligible uh, ring strain. Whereas the three carbon bridged on either side of it have more ring strain, but even not, not enough to count for the full difference in reactivity and the, the sort of trans three bridged on the, uh, uh, on the, middle, uh, on the middle right is more strained than the five bridged ferrocene on the um, immediately to its to its left. So ring strain doesn't uh, doesn't answer the the the, um, uh, the question here. Um, you'd notice that the two most active ferrocenophanes are the ones that have the same stereochemistry that have this cis bridged right. So that as drawn here, both the tether and the pulling attachments are on the front of the, um, uh, all of them are on the front of the molecule uh, as it's facing you on the, on the screen. And so she came up with the, uh, the following hypothesis, right? That if in the unbridged ferrocene, as you pull on that, the first thing that's gonna happen is that those pulling attachment points should rotate 180 degrees away from each other. Uh, whereas for um, some of the bridged ferrocenes, it's much more difficult, if not impossible, to reorient those, those pulling points just by rotating around the iron cyclopentadiene axis. And the consequence of that restricted rotation is that whereas for the ferrocene, once you pull those points away from each other, now, in order to separate the uh, cyclopentadiene from the from the ferrocene, you essentially should need to shear it, to kind of slide it off the the top or the the bottom of the, of your sandwich. Whereas for the ferrocene of fame, right, especially if I'm completely locked, pulling one of those ligands off would occur in a in more of a peeling motion. Okay, and so to test whether that uh, um, uh, fairly qualitative expectation um, is, uh, you know, might be uh, actually operative, we did some, uh, some computation and essentially simulated the pulling um, uh, using fairly standard uh, electronic structure calculations. And what these uh, pictures on the left show is exactly what we had, uh, what we had expected. Right, um, and so hopefully you can see that the at the top that's the most active structure. Right, that those two pulling attachments stay pretty much locked into place, and you can sort of see the cyclopentadiene peeling away from the uh, from the ferrocenophane. Whereas in the fer untethered ferrocene at the bottom, right, you get that initial rotation followed by two uh, parallel cyclopentadiene rings just sort of sliding away from each other over the course of the reaction. And you can actually go and quantify this in terms of the geometrical parameters, right? The relative uh, eclipsing angle alpha of the two pulling attachments, and then the deviation from, uh, uh, from a parallel arrangement of the, um, of the two CP rings. And so we can take those and actually use it to kind of characterize what these pictures are telling us a little bit more. And so, in fact, if you do that analysis on the most active three carbon cis bridged ferrocenophane, um, what you see is that as you stretch that, the eclipsing angle shown in orange here stays, you know, essentially fully eclipsing until that little red point at close to 15 angstroms 
which is the um, what we take to be the breaking point by examining the uh, structural evolution on the um, uh, that comes out of the uh, out of the calculations, right? So it's fully restricted. Um, but as you pull the um, the peeling motion, that change in plane plane uh, angle. Uh, gradually changes, right? So you can see the peeling that's occurring in blue uh, even well before and up to the point of breaking again shown in red. Barracene, it's exactly the opposite, right? You see complete change in the orange, the reorientation, but it stays parallel as shown, uh, as shown in blue here up to the point of, of breaking. And then for the five-membered cis-bridged or the three-membered trans-bridged compounds, we can do similar sorts of analyses and classify those as being mostly peeling in the case of the cis-5 or mostly shearing in the case of the trans-3. Uh, trans and if I just take that um, side chain angle alpha at the point where it, uh, where it breaks as a measure of how much peeling there is uh, versus, uh, versus shearing, what we see is there's a very nice uh, correlation right, between the extent of peeling character and the ease at which um, we can pull that, uh, that uh, cyclopentadiene off of the, uh, the ferrocene. Right? And so by uh, making these distal attachments on the ferrocene that are far away from where we're actually pulling, right, on, off on the other side of the molecule, we can essentially enforce a mechanistic pathway, a reaction coordinate to this reaction. And that mechanism has a relatively profound impact uh, here on the order of, you know, like a, a million fold difference in reactivity at the, at the forces of around a thousand picometers where the chemistry is happening, uh, happening here. Um, and, so, um, and so again, same starting point, putting these attachments on the other side of the molecule. And by restricting things, we can create sort of million fold reactivity uh, in enhancements here. Um, what's, uh, what's great about this is that that single molecule behavior actually translates to the, to the bulk. So in the, in the example shown here, we've taken either ferrocene at the top or the most active ferrocenophane at the, the bottom and now embedded these as cross-linkers in a silicone elastomer. So think of a material that's a lot like the caulking that you use um, in, your, uh, you know, in your, your shower or kitchen sink here, right? So nice rubbery material. If you take it, and here this is done with sort of controlled drop test, you basically drop a heavy weight from a couple of feet above. So it's a high impact, high strain rate event that triggers the release of iron. And what you can see is that in that sort of you know, millisecond of, of impact from, the, um, uh, from dropping the, the weight on the, the material, that restricting the ability of that ferrocenophane to rotate so that it responds by peeling in that high impact uh, event actually leads to increased release of iron which here is trapped by a phenanthrolene ligand, giving it this nice uh, deep reddish orange uh, hue. Um, and so it's a you know, nice irreversible color change that can be used for kind of colorimetric sensing of, uh, of a, a mechanical uh, event. And one of the things we like about this, uh, this system is that the actual color change itself is tunable simply by changing the ligand that we uh, add in to trap the released iron to. Um, so if we instead use this, um, what's effectively like a, a trispyridine type, uh, type structure here, the, the picture uh, doesn't quite do it justice, but it's sort of a, a, um, a dark green, um, you know, verging on, uh, uh, verging on brownish black um, uh, color that comes out of the, uh, the iron complex that you trap there and so we can sort of tune the the nature of the color that is produced uh, relatively easily to match it to um, to the spectroscopic opportunity of a given uh, material uh, question uh, for example in addition to reporting on the mechanics through this color change we can also change mechanical properties and so sort of a proof of concept 
here takes advantage of the fact that those cyclopentadiene ligands, once they're released from the iron, are quite reactive. Uh, and in fact, they're uh, reactive with each other or with other alkenes along the polymer backbone through cycloaddition uh, chemistry, Diels-Alder type, uh, type chemistry. And so we can take advantage of that to um, take these polymers, expose them here to very mechanically destructive shear forces that are generated by pulsed ultrasonication of polymer solutions. Uh, those mechanical forces actually break the polymers, degrade molecular weight, but we form more bonds through cross-linking than we break mechanically. And so you can actually hopefully see on the bottom photo little particulates that have formed as a, as a result of that. And this comes from uh, the ability to, again, goes back to this idea of using the ferrocenophanes, right? Because we can get multiple activations per, per chain. If each chain breaking, we're just creating one reactive chain end, then kind of our bonds broken couldn't really outpace, our bonds formed couldn't outpace our, our chains broken, right? And so it's this ability to, um, uh, to, to get multiple activations per chain that allows this kind of strengthening chemistry to, uh, to, to occur. Okay, so quick, uh, quick summary of this. By putting distal conformational locks, we can guide a reaction pathway that allows us to more easily activate ferrocenes that give a tunable color change, um, have potential for cross-linking in, uh, in materials, um, and also is uh, you know, leading us down pathways where we think we can access increased mechanical activity that only shows up, right? Reactivity only shows up when we want it to through a mechanical triggering um, and not uh, as, as a result of, um, and doesn't occur when, like, for example, when the material is just, uh, is just sitting, uh, sitting around. All right, and see, I'm, uh, I'm kind of up, uh, up against the, um, the, the time here. So actually I'll, I'll stop, uh, uh, stop this um, and be delighted to take, uh, take any questions. All right. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, we have a few questions from the audience. First, uh, can you please describe in more detail how you extract reaction rate constants from force distance curves? It looks yeah. like transition state is a point or a maxima. So how do you manipulate this curve to extract what you want? Yeah, that's a great, um, a great question. Okay, so if I go back here, um, so, and is my arrow showing? Yes, it is. Okay, fantastic. All right, so, so normal polymer with no reactions, right, essentially would look like this and then go up this dotted line, right? Whereas uh, without it or with the reaction, I come to curve C, right? Which, and then the fully reacted polymer, you could sort of imagine would curve around like, uh, like my arrow is drawing here, right? And so, um, so along this red transition, I am somewhere in between the dotted line and the curve not shown, right? This curve down here. But because I, so I sort of extrapolate what this dotted line looks like and what this uh, post-transition curve looked like, and we can actually measure the post-transition curve, although I don't have it shown here. And I can figure out for each point on this red line essentially how far am I between the no reaction and the fully reacted curve. And so I can take, that gives me the extent of reaction um, as a function of time, and then I know the force history. And so by putting those two things together, I can extract the, um, the, uh, the probability of a reaction occurring as, uh, as a function of time for a given force. I should say that um, there's an, another way that we can do this experiment and, and have, uh, have done it, although I didn't show the, the data here, which is we can actually trap the polymer at a constant force um, and then uh, essentially through a force feedback loop, maintain that constant force as the polymer grows longer. Um, and so uh, that's even more straightforward because there you get a, you know, a very nice sort of first order 
change in polymer length at a fixed force and you just fit that to a you know to the first order kinetics and get the get the rate constant um the rate constants that we uh, as a function of force that we get from both of those methods are internally consistent and and we feel very good about the methodology uh, the question then of like how do we measure a transition state um, comes not from what we observe directly in the AFM, but from how we treat that uh, kinetic data. So once I know rate as a function of force, I know change, I can essentially get a, um, a reaction rate in the absence of force. So I know how much that rate is changing due to force. That tells me a difference in activation energies. And energy is a force times a distance. And because I know the force and I know the change in energy, I can essentially measure the change in, in length, which is the distance that I, that I get out of that. Um, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but that's kind of at the core of the, the physics uh, of it. All right. Thank you very much. Our next question is, since your stress experiments are non-equilibrium, are you using the jar? jar excuse me, Jarzinski equality to find the free energy difference between intact and broken states? You know, uh, we, we are not. That's a, it's a great question. I think there are, um, there are opportunities um, uh, probably to, uh, to do that. Uh, we, we have not, uh, have not uh, pursued that. But uh, yeah, it's a great question. We have, we have thought about it. All right. Thank you. Oh, let's do just one more. Um, could peeling be thought of as a bending moment coupled with shear? This might explain the importance of attachment location. Yeah, so um, so bend, peeling is bending plus shear. Yeah, so it depends a little bit on, on exactly how you define, um, define these things. We did um, in the analysis, I presented probably the, the simpler of the analyses that we've we've done uh, for this, but there are other sort of other vectors that are a little more complicated that have some of, of uh, you know, what you're discussing is, um, as being um, uh, involved, uh, involved in it. Um, yeah, peeling and shear so rigorously here, you know, I would think of, of peeling as sort of fixed center of, of uh, you know, of, of, of mass, if you will, with very you know relatively little displacement, um, but um, but yeah, there are there are more complicated ways of kind of breaking the mechanics uh, mechanics down uh, down here. I don't know that we, in kind of full honesty, I don't know that we have like the resolution within the structures involved here to to really make a first principles analysis that would allow us to talk about those. Um, mechanistic differentiations in, a, in any kind of quantitative way. But if, if I understand you correctly, what you're, what you're saying is that, so peeling, I've kind of, like I've got this bending, but I also might have like some displacement of the kind of uh, center of mass of one ligand relative to the other along the, uh, along the, the, along the curve. Yeah, it's a, it's a, that's a good, that's a good question. It, you know, it has to matter on some on some level. One of the things that we did computationally, for example, was to essentially to take the untethered ferrocene and say, what happens if I pull on it, but I just on the computer don't allow it to reorient? Okay, so that those require those two attachment points to stay um, to stay aligned and overlapping. Um, and one of the things that we uh, that came out of that was that the the tether does play a role essentially because it restricts right as I pull on one of those uh, CPs right if I've got a tether down here then I, I'm actually compressing that tether in a way that I don't if the bridge isn't there that I enforce the the quote unquote peeling mechanism or restrict the the reorientation. Um, and so, um, uh, so I think that, you know, these, the, I guess the reason I mentioned that is that to acknowledge the fact that sort of just saying peeling in the absence of all the subtleties of other 
uh, motions and pathways that could be associated with it is is an oversimplification, but I think one that that's generally pretty useful uh, in the context of uh, of molecular design. All right. Uh, thank you very much. It seems like we're up against our time. So first of all, thank you to the audience. Thanks everyone for showing up and participating in the CMCC mechanochemistry discussions. And mostly thank you so much, Dr. Craig, for participating. We really appreciate your